I have some questions for you. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? How many for the chicken? How many for the egg? How many are brain dead out there? That didn't? <laughs> I only saw about 25% raise their hands. All right, let me try it, try, this, try it this way. Is the egg the gift from the chicken or is the chicken the gift from the egg? How many think it's first? Second? I'm going to ask the rest of you. <laughs> let me try this. Which came first, that God has loved us first or we have first loved God? How many vote for God first? How many for us first? Not bad. Okay. <laughs> Now, here's a tougher question for all you smarty pants that got all the answers right so far. Can love exist between two people if no gifts are given and none are received? How many think yes? How many think no? All right, okay. Here's another one. Can gifts be given and received in the absence of love? Can gifts be given and received in the absence of love? How many think yes? How many think no? Well, the correct smarty pants answer is, it depends upon what you mean by love, and it depends upon what you mean by gifts. So let me explain this, okay? Well, the year was 1949, and the place was a Ben Franklin dime store in St. Anne, Missouri. I was four years old, and I was there with my mother. And I'm pretty sure this was the first time in my life that I had bought a gift for another person. Well, my mom gave me a dollar bill and told me to buy presents for the family and then to come back to her if uh, I ran out of money before finding gifts for all the family. That would be my mom and my dad and my six-year-old brother and my two baby sisters. Now, you're snickering, but a dollar would go a long way back in 1949 at a five and ten store. And the first gift I selected uh, was something for my mom, and I was absolutely positively sure that she'd just love it. It was a white handkerchief with red and green and blue embroidery around the edges. But it cost me a dollar. So I spent all my money. I went and found my mother in the next aisle and I asked her for more money. And she was a little surprised that I'd spent so much in such a short amount of time. And she said, well, what did you buy? So I showed it to her and I told her what it was. Or showed it to her and told her who it was for. Well, she just smiled at me and she gave me another dollar. And I now know that the smile that she gave me was not about this fancy handkerchief that she had absolutely no use for. It was a smile of love of a mother for her child. Well, the year was 4 BC. And it was not really four years before the birth of Christ because we now know from historians that Christ was born around 4 BC. And the place was somewhere in what is, was known at that time as Judea. And there was a house, and there was a man, and a woman, his wife, and their baby son. And some strange and exotic strangers from very far away came to pay them a visit. And they brought three gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh for the little baby. Now, if the child had been old enough to appreciate those gifts, he would have smiled. He would have smiled even though he had no real use for gold or frankincense or myrrh. He would have known that gold was present fit for a king, but he would have no need of gold because his kingdom was not of this world. He would have known that frankincense was a present fit for a priest to use in temple sacrifice and worship. But he had no need of frankincense because he was a high priest whose sacrifice would be totally different in the years to come. And he would have known that myrrh was a gift used to embalm a dead body. But he had no need of myrrh because his dead body would be preserved in a way that would astonish people of the world forevermore. So his smile would not be because of the things that he received that day, his smile would have been about the love that was given and received that day. Now, there are gifts and there are gifts, and I think we all know that. The most expensive gift in the world is, that is not given out of love has no real value. It could be a Mercedes-Benz or a diamond ring given by a person out of pure obligation or out of a need to control or manipulate 
or out of desire to get something back of equal value in return that would have no value whatsoever in the long run. A crayon drawing made by a child or a grandchild has no intrinsic monetary value, but it's a priceless gift because it's given in love and it's received in love. And so what really makes a gift a gift is the love in which it is given. And the physical gift itself takes on added value because of the motive of the giver and the relationship of the giver with the receiver. A true gift is most importantly a symbol of love. It's a symbol of love whose only goal is the happiness and well-being of the other. It's a love worth dying for. And the gift is a reflection of the relationship between two people. Now we all know, we, we all know how touched we've been when someone we love surprises us with a gift that really delights us. And as the old saying go, it's the gift, it's the thought that counts. It's the thinking that you put into this gift that makes it so precious. It's knowing that you know me so well that you know what gives me pleasure. It's the effort you went into to order to make me happy. So it really is the thought that counts because it's clear that you were thinking of me rather than of yourself. And a gift given in love not only reflects the relationship between the one who gives and the one who receives, it actually transforms the relationship. See, your, your giving to me is at its deepest level the gift of yourself. And in your love for me, you put, your, you put me ahead of yourself. You put my happiness ahead of yours. Your love for me, symbolized by the gift of yourself, has a transformative effect on the relationship, and it transforms me. The gift of yourself to me makes me want to give myself back to you in return. And not because I feel obligated, but because it's just the natural thing to do. It just happens that way. Love freely given results in love freely returned. Well, the Magi worked long and hard to seek out, to find, and to deliver their gifts to the one who is the giver of all gifts. And how pleasing it must have been to the Lord of all to have his creatures approach him in this manner. And not because he needs anything that they have to give him, but because he delights in love that is given and received because, after all, he is love itself. And how pleasing it must be to the Father of all to see his sons and his daughters working long and hard to seek out, to find, and to deliver tokens of love to each other. And how pleasing it must be for the one who emptied himself for our sake to see us empty ourselves for the sake of one another. So wherever there is love, there will be gifts given and received. Now, I can't prove or explain that. I just believe that to be true. I know that when we love deeply, we want to give ourselves to the one that we love. We want to be one with them, and we want to seek a unity that death itself could not destroy. And the gifts we give are the, at their very best symbols of the gift of ourselves one to another. It's me given to you, and it's you given to me. The gift given is a meager attempt to do what I desperately want to do, but I don't know how to do. And that's to give myself to you and to become one with you. So can love exist if no gifts are given? I think not. Can gifts be given if there is no love? I think not. Not in the way I, at least I just explained. Well, in this coming year, there will be many gifts given and many gifts received as we celebrate birthdays and baptisms and graduations and weddings and just 12 short months from now, another Christmas. And so may the gifts that we give on those days always be a symbol of the love that we have for the beloved. And may those gifts always include the gift of ourselves. And in this coming week and even on this very day, there will be many opportunities to give the gift of ourselves in a smile, a word, a touch, an act of kindness or generosity. And we who are gathered here this morning are participating in the greatest gift of all. In a few short moments, some members of our community will walk up this aisle here 
And they'll be bringing gifts, not of gold, frankincense, of myrrh. They'll be bringing gifts of simple bread and common wine that will be offered in thanksgiving on this altar. And those gifts that we offer are actually gifts that we have already received. God's already given us the earth to cultivate and the vineyard to tend to provide the wheat and the grape that human hands have shaped into bread and wine. Well, in my mind, that's reminiscent of the story I told you at the beginning of this homily about the first gift that I ever bought for anyone. Just as my mother gave me a dollar to buy her a Christmas gift 60 years ago, God now today gives us bread and wine so that we can give it back. But there's something more here than the bread and wine that we give to our God. Because when God gives it back to us, what we have given to him, it's been transformed into the body and blood of Jesus himself. So it is Jesus himself that we are given. And this gift of bread and wine changed into body and blood transforms us like no gift could, like no other gift could possibly because it makes us able to share in the life of the divine. That's a gift.